Hello, my name's Christopher Joel, and I'm the regimental historian of the Household Cavalry. Now, over the coming weeks, I'm going to be trying to lighten the gloom that's all around us by recounting some extraordinary stories about our regiments that you've probably never heard before. Because, you see, the Household Cavalry is not just about boots and saddles. And in the immortal words of Michael Caine... That is not many people know that. In this week's podcast, I'm going to tell you about the life and death of a very remarkable lifeguard. This sporting life. The tradition of harbouring and fostering sporting ability in the regiments of the Household Cavalry is a long one and starts with Corporal of Horse Jack Shaw of the Second Lifeguards. However, until the institution of the Victoria Cross in 1857, most of the military and sporting deeds of private soldiers and NCOs went unremarked by the public. Another ranker with a profile that was unrelated to his military service was an even rarer creature. One such was Jack Shaw, who, in his lifetime, was famed as a prize fighter and artist model, as well as being recognised by Lord Macaulay as one of the heroes of the Battle of Waterloo. Were that not enough, he would later be immortalised by Charles Dickens in Bleak House. A prosperous Nottinghamshire farmer's son, Shaw was a sickly child whose life was feared for by the local doctor, who prescribed a liberal supply of new milk to save his life. His father assigned young Jack a cow for his exclusive use, and the weakling child grew into a strapping adolescent weighing 15 stone and standing just over 6 feet. Had he been born 150 years later, he would undoubtedly have been a pin-up boy for the milk marketing board and their drink-a-pint-of-milk-a-day advertisement, although his pugnacious behaviour at school might have caused the board some embarrassment. Apprenticed to a wheelwright at the age of 13, Shaw lost his place for fighting with his fellow apprentices and returned home in disgrace. He then turned his pugilistic hands to estate carpentry at Woolerton Hall, where he might have remained for the rest of his life had he not gone to the Nottingham Goose Fair. There, at the urging of his friends, he climbed into the ring for a prize fight with a local man much older and three stone heavier than himself. After several rounds, Shaw was starting to flag when a voice from the crowd yelled, Youngster, do not give in. Fight slow and careful and you're sure to lick him as my name is Jem Belcher. This encouragement from the champion of all England must have inspired the young carpenter for he went on to win the fight. Nothing further is known about Shaw's nascent boxing career until, two months short of his 18th birthday, he enlisted in the Second Lifeguards. Soon after joining the regiment, then stationed at Regent's Park Barracks, there was an incident which marked him out as a natural boxer and launched his career in the ring. Three yobs in Portman Square were shouting insults at passing soldiers and mocking their red tunics. Unfortunately for them... Shaw was one of the soldiers, and in short order, he knocked out all of them. This feat soon came to the ears of the officers of the Second Lifeguards, some of whom were sporting Corinthians and keen supporters of the noble art. In no time at all, the necessary financial arrangements were made for Shaw to train at London's leading boxing hall, Fives Court, in Little St Martin Street. His success there prompted his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Barton, a well-heeled sponsor of boxers, to send him to Jackson's Rooms in Bond Street. Jackson's was a fashionable club and boxing academy which had been established in 1795 by the then champion of all England, Gentleman John Jackson. Under the guidance of Jackson himself, Shaw started fighting under the nickname of the Milling Lifeguardsman. In due course, and thanks to Jackson's teaching, Shaw defeated the African-American boxer Tom the Moore Molyneux and Captain Barclay, alternatively known as Captain Robert Barclay Allardyce of the 23rd Regiment of Foot, later the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, who was a claimant to the throne of Scotland and reputedly the best amateur boxer in the country. During his time at Jackson's, Shaw's handsome face and rippling physique also came to the attention of London's artistic elite and, when not boxing or carrying out his light duties in the Second Lifeguards, 
he developed a profitable sideline as an artist model, posing for Sir Edward Landseer, Benjamin Hayden, in whose studio he met the poet Sir Walter Scott, John Higton and William Etty, a noted painter of male nudes. Back in the boxing ring, Shaw's only recorded defeat took place at the Royal Tennis Court, where he was pitted against Jem Belcher's younger brother, Tom. Despite being defeated in this contest, on the 12th of July 1812, at Coombe Warren, Kingston-upon-Thames, Shaw faced the professional boxer William Bill Burrows in his first bare-knuckle fight. Thirteen rounds and 17 minutes later, Burrows' second threw in the towel. This result put Shaw in contention for the championship of all England. Unfortunately, Napoleon intervened and Shaw, recently promoted to Corporal of Horse, was sent with his squadron as part of the Composite Household Brigade to the peninsula in October 1812. The following year, the British army crossed the Pyrenees and Napoleon abdicated, but Shaw did not return with his comrades to England. Instead, he accompanied Major General the Honourable Sir William Punsonby to Paris, where the general, who would later be killed at Waterloo, was tasked by Wellington with making the preparations for the Congress of Vienna, and Shaw had the opportunity to fence with some French cuirassiers. It was an experience that was to stand him in good stead two years later. Early in 1815, Shaw returned to England, rejoined his regiment, and resumed his boxing career. On the 18th of April 1815, in front of a large crowd on Hounslow Heath, he faced Ned Painter. Over the next 28 minutes, Painter was knocked down ten times by Shaw. On the back of this success, Shaw proposed to challenge Tom Cribb for the All England Championship. But once again, Napoleon intervened. With the French Emperor once again on the loose, on the 1st of May 1815, the second lifeguard sailed for Ostend and the Waterloo campaign. Following the inconclusive clash at Quatre Bras, on the 17th of June at Genappe, the first and second lifeguards charged the advancing French to help cover the Allies' fighting withdrawal to Waterloo. It was an action that earned the praise of the Earl of Uxbridge, the Allied cavalry commander, and a chest wound for sure. However, it was not nearly serious enough to keep the challenger for the All England crown from battle the next day. So, after his wound had been dressed, he returned to frontline duty with his regiment. What followed on the 18th of June 1815 is the stuff of both myths and legends, including the stories that Shaw and some of his colleagues had started the day by making very free with a rum ration which they'd been sent to collect, and that later in the morning the same group had been happily looting a dairy when they were rudely interrupted by the opening salvo of the battle. True or false, by the time the French attack started, Shaw was in the saddle with his sword drawn, ready when the order came from Lord Uxbridge for both the British brigades of heavy cavalry, the Union and the Household, to disrupt the attack by Delon's corps on the centre of the Allied line at La Haye Sainte Farm. For the second lifeguards, this involved a charge at the French 1st Regiment of Cuirassiers, accoutred in steel breast and back plates, a fashion later adopted by the 1st and 2nd lifeguards. Based on his experiences in Paris, Shaw had already advised his troop to aim their sword cuts at the base of a cuirassier's head, a spot which was unprotected by either cuirass or helmet. The second lifeguards duly smashed into the cuirassiers, the effect being like an irresistible force meeting an immovable object. Some of the cuirassiers fled, whilst others stood their ground. One such was a Frenchman who openly challenged Shaw to single combat. It was not a wise move on his part, for, as the cuirassier lunged, Shaw parried his blade and then brought his own sword down on the man's helmet, cleaving his head in half, such that his face fell off like a bit of an apple. Eight more cuirassiers now challenged Shaw, and each in turn was dispatched by a simple, if unorthodox, technique of swordsmanship. Shaw punched each in the face with the hilt of his sword, and then sliced through their exposed necks as they turned their backs. The last man, called out in English, 
with an Irish accent, which I'm not going to attempt. Damn you! I'll stop your crowing! He too fell like the rest. Fired by their success in disrupting Derlon's attack and routing the French cavalry, but against orders, both brigades of heavy cavalry continued their charge into the French Grand Battery and on into the artillery wagon train behind it. That it was a terrible mistake became clear when the intermingled and thoroughly exhausted British cavalry brigades were countercharged by two and a half thousand fresh French cavalry consisting of lancers and more cuirassiers. Shaw found himself cut off from his troop, but continued with his slaughter of the French until his sword blade snapped. Undaunted, he then used the sword hilt as a club, and when that was dashed from his hand, ripped off his helmet and swung that as a weapon. In the end, with more than twenty sword wounds, Shaw was finally felled from his saddle by a wounded French drummer boy's pistol shot. Mortally wounded, Shaw was dragged towards the French rear, where he was dumped onto a dung heap. Here he was joined by another wounded lifeguard. On seeing this man, Shaw looked up and said, Ah, my dear fellow, I'm done for. When he was found the next morning by British troops, Shaw was indeed dead. But that was not by any means the end of Corporal of Horse Jack Shaw. Initially, his body was buried in a marked grave, an unusual event in itself, at La Aissante on the day after the battle. But several years later, it was disinterred for reburial in England. Shaw mythology asserts that this was done at the urging of Sir Walter Scott, who'd been somewhat obsessed with Shaw since he'd met him in Hayden's studio, and further asserts that Scott acquired Shaw's skull and kept it in his library at Abbotsford, where it remains to the present day. History does not relate what happened to the rest of Shaw's bones. Meanwhile, two plaster casts were made of the skull, one of which is now in the Household Cavalry Museum, and the other was believed to be in the collection of the Royal United Services Institution, along with the skeleton of Napoleon's horse, Marengo. It has recently emerged, however, that Shaw's skull at Abbotsford is one of the plaster casts, and that Shaw's actual skull was the one held at Rusi, although how the museum acquired it remains a mystery. In 1898, the then curator of the Rusi Museum seems to have been queasy at exhibiting the human remains of a British soldier, and he arranged with the incumbent of Shaw's home church at Cossel in Lincolnshire to give the remains a decent burial close to the pillar near the font, and adjacent to the memorial to him. This was done quietly on the 21st of June 1898. In addition to the monument in Shaw's memory at Cossel Church, there is a street named after him in of all places and for no apparent reason, Preston Pans. However, the last words on the remarkable Corporal of Horse Jack Shaw are best left to Charles Dickens, who, in Bleak House, as Inspector Bucket say, Old Shaw the lifeguardsman? Why, he's the model of the British Army itself. Ladies and gentlemen, I give a fifty-pound note to be such a figure of a man. This story, along with the rest of the series, is drawn from my book, The Drum Horse in the Fountain, which is available from Amazon and all good bookshops, should they ever open again. Next week... I'll be talking about the remarkable Colonel David Smiley of the Blues.